my whole approach was and, and has been to, in the past is to go in deep, figure out what the problem is, and then state what I want to see. And make, once I understand it, and once I and I didn't want to understand it from a theory perspective, hmm. I wanted to understand it the way Elon Musk understands. You know, he didn't hire a chief scientist to put a rocket on the moon. He couldn't find one, or no one that wanted to work with him. So he became the chief scientist. He wasn't trained to put rockets on Mars. He t he's just taken over Twitter. He's not telling people what to do. He's actually in there looking at the code. But I guarantee you, he can only stay there a certain amount of time. He's going to yep. state to his team what he wants done and and then back up. Hey there, friend. This is Stephanie Krevins, and you're listening to the Hot Mess Hotline, where we teach ambitious leaders how to lead with strategy, innovation, and focus for their big transformational projects. That could be new business results. It could be digital transformation. Whatever you're going through, we've got hard earned lessons from CEOs who have been there, done that, so you don't have to learn the hard way. And today's guest is Bill Murphy. Bill founded Red Zone Technologies in 2001 with the vision of deploying an elite team of experts, rigorous assessments, and dependable solutions to thrive in the Red Zone. Then with his team of experts managing the most challenging IT security projects and unlike many consistently closing the gap on the final 20% of project deliverables. Y'all, how many great consultants you got out there that know how to wrap that project up and run that last 10, 20% of the project? Bill Murphy and his team at Red Zone do that. He has recruited and trained an elite team of IT security specialists and has developed the CIO scoreboard and security assessment methodology to work in unison with his clients. The success of his vision has meant consistently delivering on these promises and earning customers lifelong loyalty. My friend, you will hear about Bill's intelligence, humility, confidence, and strength in this conversation and through his hot mess. Let's dig in. Let's go ahead and dig in. Bill, tell me about your hot mess. So, okay. Well, I would say, so I've, I've been in, in business for 22 years, uh, founded my company, but you know, I've had several inflection points through the, I'll call them inflection points through the years. I like that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I would say, I'd say 2022 was important, uh, probably in, oh, I would say in the May, May timeframe, I was uh, not sleeping at all. Well, very sleeping, very, very little. Mm. And uh, primarily always uh, had a lot, a lot of pressure started. I thought I needed to go to the hospital. And so I set up a, a meeting with the cardiologist because I felt like I was having some some heart problems. I was doing my my group sessions, which I've been doing for many many years. So uh, I had a hard time believing that I was pretty well conditioned as a as an athlete and doing a lot of very difficult things, you know, mm. ra races and things like that. But I started to um, my heart rate when it got up to a certain level uh, almost felt like I was going to be passing out. So. I went to the cardiologist and they put me on a treadmill and I essentially, you know, broke records on the treadmill and they took scans and they took pictures and, you know, I've got uh, very uh, echo cardiograms and, uh, and nuclear cardio. I mean, I had everything done so they could all the see tests. Yes. All every, the every tests. single, like it was just nothing that they didn't because they actually took pictures and they thought there was something going on, but it mm. turned out that uh, I was, I had a normal 50 year old heart, uh, as far as what they, uh, considered normal yeah. and, and I wasn't having uh, a heart attack or anything that related to that. It was just the, uh, the intensity of what, what I was uh, going through with my business was just manifesting in my body. Uh, I literally couldn't keep up. It was putting sort of a way I would say it would be like a governor valve it was putting a governor valve on my activities because it's like it, it, there was there was, uh, it was, uh, fighting to, for balance. And mm. so, um, uh, so that, that was my, uh, kind of inflection point that was probably, I would say in the May, April, May timeframe of 2022. Oh, wow. So your body is telling you something is wrong. And, and my guess is you are a successful entrepreneur, which means you can carry a lot of stress for a long time, a lot of burden for a long time. And now it's showing up in your body. The doctors can't find anything. And so 
do they did they have the stress conversation with you like hey bill man what's going on in your life you know it it they you know the doctors are very they're very scientific and they just want to know uh, well this had happened in 2008 as well and mm. the doctor there had walked me out after doing same levels of tests i literally drove myself to the emergency room in 2008 wow. and it was also a major inflection point with the business and i was coming back from a customer uh, I was going to a customer site for a visit and I thought, you know, this is not right. This, I'm not feeling right. So on the way back, I just went right to the emergency room and you get ushered to the front of the line in the emergency room when you go in with anything heart related. And like then, uh, it would turn out to be nothing, but I was uh, really thinking it was something this time around. And uh, I, I'm very active and very um, athletic in what I do and I'm always working out and it's a great way to manage stress I found through the years and yes. it's a great way to get in the zone and, and sort of, um, uh, and I'm with a group. So there's a lot of accountability in that group. So it's not just something that I, I, um, uh, I do lightly. It's, it's pretty, pretty, um, intense. And so I do that on, on purpose and I enjoy it. I was an athlete in college and such. So it's a great way to kind of continue that as I mm -hmm. as you get older, but, uh, the, it was just interesting. The, the body does have a, or at least, uh, I was listening to it and noticed that something was off. So the doctor yes. in 2008 said, look, he walked me out to the his waiting room and said, look, you're going to look like these old, old, most of the people in there are in their 70s and 80s. You're going to be just like these folks, but you're going to suffer from hypertension. And he goes, you're going to need to go find uh, something else to do. And so I started taking up Ironmans and, and some really, really big, big um, type of um, athletic stuff. And that was in 08. And, and then fast forward to this past year in 2020, yes. and they just more took a scientific approach to it and like, nope, nothing's wrong with your heart. And so then I, I knew at that point that I just had to uh, reevaluate, you know, what was happening and, and, and move from there. Wow. So metaphorically, your body was bringing itself to its knees because of the stress in your life and business. So tell us what was the hot mess in the business that was colluding against your body at that time. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a great, great thing. So my, my, um, I'm a, a visionary by definition, I, different yes. business owners have different skills and such. And, you know, some come from a real, um, kind of a technical operational background. Some come from more of a, um, a sales and kind of visionary background. So I'm more on the vision sales side. And, and so I was essentially had, I'm always probably five years in front of my business capabilities. And so what I did is I just was, I had acted on some growth plans that, but the business really wasn't uh, ready for it. And okay. so I was essentially not building um, smartly. It's, that's not a word, but I wasn't building intelligently. So that's what I had to really look at very closely. Yeah. Oh my gosh. So what was the conflict, the tension that was telling you the business was not ready for the company that needed to be five years in the future, which ironically, well, yeah, so about 2027. So you're building 2027 yeah. and 2022. What mm -hmm. were the symptoms that you were seeing? Well, there was just increased complexity with the business. We had gone through some um, acquisition. We had done some acquisitions, and and uh, but within the core operations of the business, there was really too much complexity uh, that that had manifest. And so my natural skill as a, as an entrepreneur is not, and putting processes and procedures together, it's not that that's just not my, uh, why I was on, put on the planet was, yep. was to put process procedures in place. But, um, for me to, uh, achieve and for the business to achieve, it's the big lofty goals that we had. We actually needed to scale the, the foundation, uh, as much as, as the, uh, playing offense with where we were going into the future. Mm. And that's what we were, that's what we were lacking in at, at that time. Yeah. That makes all the sense in the world, especially when you have acquisitions, when you bring in other people from other companies with completely different ways of working and culture and expectations. What, do you have a specific example while honoring, you know, the confidentiality yeah. of that time, but like, tell us, tell us about what that complexity specifically looked like with sure. your people, with your customers. Yeah, there was, so there needed, I, I, I had my peers that I'd, uh, 
that I, my entrepreneur peers that I network with and go to meetings with, they had um, probably five years ago started to introduce me to uh, different frameworks that they'd use for their businesses that had allowed them to scale into the future. And uh, although my intuition was like, that's the right way to do it. And we had actually serious conversations about it. I was more, I more was thinking that I was going to find that through hiring individuals ah. and versus actually having the framework first. And I thought that the, the individual would be able to come in with the framework and in, in, uh, to be able to 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 uh, basically lay that into the business and and truth be told is there are there are probably a lot of individuals out there that that do have that capability and could come into a you know, business and lay that foundation in place and and really execute. It's just that uh, I, in retrospect, I needed to have that foundation uh, that set uh, that foundation principles in place first, and yes. so. We, you know, we went out. So the, there's different comp- there's there's different ways to do that. I think there's, there's scaling up. Uh, there's EOS. There's and there's probably other foundations as well. And there are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so we just took on EOS. It stands for Entrepreneurial Operating System. And and so I basically what I did is I came out of that uh, the business. I came out of that hospital slash health issue uh, time frame, and I'm and I said I just made the decision that I was getting back into the the guts into the weeds of the company, which I've done at different times, but I like to, uh, but I was going in with uh, these foundations. So I, with the, with the EOS tools and essentially um, these tools create, we we created um, and I did find some right, then I had the right people working on the right tools. uh, And that was really, really important. So that's been a huge, that's how I, we, that's how I, and we dug out of it is by really getting into the guts of the company, creating swim lanes, so that there was more, there was clarity mm-hmm. around um, our, our, who was doing what. So the right people, right seats, and and then um, creating those swim lanes and creating the communication. And so, I mean, our our value as an organization is we take complexity off of our customers, and and then we uh, create the ease and simplicity on the back end. But it is definitely complex. We can't put complex on top of complex, and Ooh. we can't scale it. Yes. So, <laughs> So gradually it de-escalated the stress because we got that in place and we uh, uh, cleaned up the financial. I mean, really every section of the business had to be, we'd reach ceilings of complexity in each in each uh, segment of the business. I call mm. them, um, and I, this is a strategic coach word, but I took a ceiling, ceilings of complexity, basically blasted through those ceilings of complexity and just really looked at the individual components, the people, the processes, and and created those swim lanes and those points of clarity that that made it more uh, easier to operate. And then we just uh, made instead of drive by meetings, you know, instead of like, hey, you help me with it, you know, that type of an atmosphere. It was yes. it became much more uh, disciplined. And that's I'm a I'm a free flowing entrepreneur, and and so these kind of things were. Um, we, I knew we needed, but I just didn't know how. And so once I had those tool sets in place, then then the people could shine around me because they, you know, they're not me and they're not supposed to be me. They're, you know, we're all on the planet to for different expertise and capabilities. And so once we were once we were able to do that, then people could shine in their different roles and their different seats. So that that made all the difference in the world. Yeah. Tell us more about what you were seeing from your people in what you were hearing, in their behaviors, in their work product that was telling you we're at a ceiling of complexity? I think it was a general confusion. It's a confusion sort of like um, it was It was always about um, doing more work and doing more effort and, and sort of um, it, it just took, a, it was taking a lot of effort for people to understand things that should be understood much more quickly. So there, mm. there was, people couldn't optimize, we couldn't optimize people's capabilities because we required heroes in every position. Mm. And, and you, as a business, you can't afford heroes in every position and you, and you can't depend. And, and I would say that most, when you're hiring people, when we were hiring people, people couldn't live up to their resumes. It was very difficult to live up to your resume because it was too confusing. And so they would come in with a certain set of skills, but we really couldn't optimize those skills because they were having to navigate um, essentially through kind of a forest of 
of like doing things instead of actually having it prepackaged, having the process and the procedure written down, and then being able to manage mistakes against the process or, or, or a procedure, and then iterating on that to make it better and better and better. So I, I think it was just confusion. Um, uh, I think it was, and, and I think that that impacts um, culture. And that I, I don't like using that word because everybody uses it now, but, but I think the work environment has improved dramatically. And I think that people just feel more competent, more capable. Yeah. Uh-huh. And, and that, that manifests into taking care of customers and, and, and growing into the future. Oh my gosh. Okay. I want to pick up on several of those things you said. First, I want to go back. You said people couldn't be he- like, you can, you can't have a hero in every rule. Break that term down for us. Um, and so yeah. that folks listening know, like when they have folks that are heroes in the roles, which means if I'm interpreting it correctly, like it's not sustainable. Cause basically if that person wins the lottery and gets to buy their private Island, they're gone. There's a part of the business that is not going to work anymore. Does that sound right? Our business is 22 years old. So mm-hmm. we had essentially a way of doing things, but it was, in, it was a uh, oral tradition. Okay. And, and so essentially it, when you're dealing with oral tradition and then there's always going to be pockets of a business that are going to be, oral tradition. I don't think you're ever going to get rid of it entirely, but when when you trying to build something, build something great, then if your business is essentially founded on oral tradition, then it takes people forever to learn how to do things because it's yes. all oral tradition. It's yes. who you know and you know, I've got to like people, you know, and I've got to like um, someone to get the right information from them. And it's just that's <sighs> ridiculous. You know, Ugh, it's like god, yeah. you know, we just want to fulfill the needs of the customer. We want to uh, help people, you know, it, it's so the customer's got to win. The internal people have to win. They have to feel like they, they are excelling. And but when it's companies built on oral tradition, you can't. It's very difficult to scale that because you've got pockets of knowledge and wisdom. And then some people just bail out and they're like, "Look, I, I I'm too confused here. I don't feel like I'm, you know, uh, performing well." And so they end up leaving. And so that's what's really helped. And then then you don't need heroes all around the company. And, and I think that that's really important. You might have heroes at the top at the leadership team that maybe have grown through with the company through time, yeah. but then you've got a, uh, I, I call it uh, when you reach the ceiling of complexity, that's a, that's also a, a ceiling of pain. It, you know, it's a ceiling of confusion. It's a ceiling of, and you, it's very difficult to grow through that. So I think it's incumbent was incumbent on me to, to realize that. And then also realize that I'm not going to hire people my way out of it. I actually had to get into it. Well, I had to roll up my own sleeves, which is aggravating to people, but that's, you know, if I feel like something's not working and, and, um, and it's causing me to go to the hospital, then I've got to get in there and and dig out. But I just didn't dig out of it from a, Oh, Bill's going to put a bunch of extra effort in. I, I went in there with a set of tools that, that, um, was this is how we operate it. We have scorecards now, we have dashboards, and everybody has a number. So everybody can can feel good about achieving because they actually are measured in, and it's not just measurement by butt and seat. Just because your butt is in a seat doesn't mean you're actually contributing. And so never, yeah. never does that mean that. Yes. And, yes. And as from a, and I think that's what it's interesting with COVID. I think it's exposing sloppy management. Mm-hmm. And, Amen. Um, Preach. Say that again, Bill. Say that again. <laughs> it's, yeah, it, de- it definitely does expose uh, sloppy management. So now we have a set of tools and we have dashboards and we have different pods within the company that are all, and it all rolls up to a set of organizational objectives. So that's, I, I'm making it sound, uh, so so the, the pressure, the hard issues sort of started going uh, disappearing. I was able to sleep through the night, which was, which was great. And, and, but now I'm starting to get to the other side of it where I'm like, okay, now we can hit our one-year goals, our three-year goals and our 10-year MTP, which is our massive, you know, transformational purpose. Oh, I love it. Yeah. Massive transformational purpose. May I ask what is your massive transformational purpose? Sure. Our goal is to secure the lives of a billion people. And, and so you know, to, so every time we work with a, a company, whether, you know, it's a CIO or a COO or, or helping them with their digital transformation or helping them with the security around that digital transformation, those, you have people within the company that you're helping to secure in the business and the intellectual property, but you're, they're also doing business with their customers. So 
you know, a credit union or an insurance company or uh, a uh, architecture firm, you know, they have hundred to 50,000, a hundred thousand uh, customers. And so when we help them, we're, we're helping. So we track, uh, we're tracking that number every time we have a new we have a new customer. We track it um, is how close we're getting to that that billion lives secured. Wow! Ooh, so I like goosebumps. <laughs> oh, I love it! All right, so let's take a commercial break. I want to come back and talk about what have you learned since being able to put this framework in place. And in particular, I want to focus on this question around how do you know when you're too far in the weeds versus leading at the right time at the right level, given your role, and when you need to kind of step in, step back versus a popular management technique that leaves everyone feeling like crap is called swoop and poop, which can be a tendency of our high level leaders and organizations. So we don't want any swoop and poop, you know, like seagulls, like coming in, coming out. But I've heard from massively successful uh, leaders that there is an element of stepping into the right kind of detail at the right time. That also is a very successful leadership technique. So let's take a quick break. We're going to come back. We're going to talk about that. Okay. Sure. Sounds great. All right. Well, we take a quick break from this amazing conversation today. I want to share with you a new tool that I have for you. I think that there's a myth in our workplaces. Well, let me say this. I know there's a myth in our workplaces that meetings have to suck. And I don't believe that whatsoever. By all accounts, our time and meetings have doubled, if not more, since the start of the pandemic. And this time with your colleagues should not be a waste of time. It should be the most valuable. So if you're looking for more resources to lead meetings that are productive, powerful, impactful, and have everyone participating, get over to my website at stephaniecrevins.com forward slash lead kickass meetings and get some new tools so that when you leave a meeting with your colleagues, you're not left going, what the actual F was that? You're going, yes, we're going to take on the world together. Let's get this done because it was an unbelievably powerful meeting. Those tools are out there for you, my friends, and they're on my website today, stephaniecrevins.com forward slash lead kickass meetings. Now let's get back into that conversation. Bill, you've got me inspired. And we also had the CTO of Active Campaign on who who had a very similar message where him and his CEO are in the details of the company in a very managed specific way. And so I would love to hear from you what, what has become your perspective and your lessons learned from this hot mess and the many others that you've been in. What has been your lesson learned around when do I step into the details, which details, when do I step out and lead as the visionary that I am? How yep. do you know how to balance that? Well, yeah, it's a yeah. I know there's a, a bunch of rules of thought on that. My my, I'm sort of like a well. I think this, this my job and what I'm good at is coming up with ideas, making them real, and finding and then I need a team around me to make them repeatable. So, uh, so when you focus on when the repeatability is falling is falling down and which reflects essentially what the engine is needed to manifest that particular product that's out there or that you're trying to sell or, or whatever the service you're trying to provide. If it, my whole thing is if I had to dive deep because it was a, it was a significant, it's a significant issue and I had asked for it to be fixed many times and it wasn't. And when it is wrong, when it feels wrong, it is wrong. And when I, when it repeats itself, it's even more wrong. And so I basically, one of the biggest things that I, I went into this was with zero fear because I realized, you know, I was, it was, it was for me, it was life or death because literally I thought I was dying. Yes. And oh my when, gosh. Yes. And, and when that happens, all bets are off. And yes. I literally went in, um, stopped wearing a tie, um, which I always do with a vest. And I was like rolled up my sleeves and I moved, I moved people. I took back over the, the role of, um, integrator or it would, the classic would be like a COO yes. and it was, and it was command and control every single, and it, and the work got harder, not easier. And however, I did it this time with a framework in place because I knew with, and with our coach, I had a, I also made sure that I had a coach that wasn't just coaching for the first time. They had actually built four public companies and had been successful 
was top ranked and I was, that was very important for me. I didn't want, I, I wanted to come in with someone who had experience and also yes. could uh, punch me in the face if I needed to and really have um, bold conversations with me. Yes. And so mm-hmm. my whole, my whole approach was and, and has been to, in the past is to go in deep, figure out what the problem is and then state what I want to see. And make, once I understand it, and once I and I didn't want to understand it from a theory perspective, mm-hmm. I wanted to understand it the way Elon Musk understands. You know, he didn't hire a chief scientist to put a rocket on the moon. He couldn't find one, or no one that wanted to work with him. So he became the chief scientist. He wasn't trained to put rockets on Mars. He t- he's just taken over Twitter. He's not telling people what to do. He's actually in there looking at the code. But I guarantee you, he can only stay there a certain amount of time. He's going to yep. state to his team what he wants done, and and then back out. And that's exactly what we did. It's just that this time. I needed to have a, I put a framework in place so that once I got into the uh, details and understood them, it could state what I wanted to see from a customer experience. Then I backed myself out of it. And we have a framework now that people can be very successful with. And that was, a, that was an important differentiator in the past. I might have done that and I have done that. If, if you want to see something happen repeatably, this is back to the repeatability then it should be reflected at the top level scorecard, or at least it should be reflected at the scorecard level of the of the managing units. But if there's something very, very important that you want to see at a leadership team, I, sh- I, I should be able to be on a desert island, a deserted island. And if a seagull dropped in a one note per week, um, I should be able to have a set of metrics that just drops into the island and I could know how the business is doing reflective of, of those details. So yes. The ceiling of complexity was just manifested by a bunch of broken details at the bottom. And it would be no different than a, a CIO. You know, one of the biggest things is, you know, multi-factor authentication and patching working well. Well, if, if uh, but that's done by very entry-level people usually in an organization. But if that mm-hmm. CIO knew that that they needed, um, they didn't want to go in front of a board because of a, of, a, of a takedown of a network due to malware, then they're going to have to have a, 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 at a very, very deep level, knowing that Henry, who just got hired, is doing patching, that it not only was patched, but there was proof that it was patched and proof that it was patched successfully. And in, yes, he's at the strategy level, but he's also going to have to report to the board, to the insurance companies, to the auditors to make sure patching is happening. Does yes. he need to go and do the patching himself? No, but if, but if, but but that's the level of reporting that w- that we've put in place at our at our core level. So oh. I just I just like to understand what's happening, and and then back myself out, and and then and then um, and and now I have I think what the biggest thing is, is now I have a five year. I think I told you my peers who had built very very successful companies and, and sold for eighty five million one and one hundred and twenty million another. They'd all done this, but I just ignored. I didn't, I didn't feel like it was right five or six years ago. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to take the the plunge into it because I, I don't know. I had some story in my head about it, but I should have done it. I should have done it when I founded the business, but I definitely should have done it six years ago because it would it would have um, made all the difference in the world. But now it's going to make all the difference in the world moving forward. That's right. And now you yeah. know better. Yeah, now you learned better. some. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh, so. One of the things that I can hear leaders saying right now, well, but Bill, the fearlessness, that, yeah. I have to stop you for a second because yeah, go. being, being, I was not afraid to lose anybody. I don't, I don't care who they were. I don't care if you've been with me 20 years, you've been with me one year. When I went in there hard, um, it was because it was hard and it was reflecting on my body and in my well being. Yep. And I wasn't afraid to lose anybody. And, I didn't make anybody wrong for it, but what I was unafraid and I didn't, wasn't afraid about my leadership style. I didn't apologize for it. I didn't care what people's thoughts were on it. I, all I did tell people is that this is not my right role moving forward. And I said, I'll be here for one quarter. In fact, the coach said, the coach said, and this is almost word for word. He goes, a visionary this deep in the company will last three months. Sometimes they'll last six months. And I lasted maybe four. And then in the leadership team meeting, I just knew I could sense that the business um, was not going to, I could sense that it, it, we were not going to make any more positive steps with me this deep. And so we re- replaced me from the deepness and then moved me into a, a, another area. Yep. And and then now we're moving them out of that area 
again, because I spent another three months in another area. So it was very, very focused and time bound. And then the team basically is like, okay, now it's time. But, but everybody was very transparent what I was, you know, where I was, how I was in there and then, and what I was saying and doing. And then we moved me out. We fired me. We basically fired, yes. um, fired me from those, those spots. And, and that's good. You know, that's good. Now, and uh, I've just moved out of another role just recently, and we're in the, in the quarter now. We're moving me out of yet another area so that I can just be plopped into the visionary role alone, and that's it. Wow. Wow. And so your health scare was May 2022. We're recording yes. this very end of January 2023. In essentially less than a year... In less than three quarters, you have been able to bring a deep sense of peace and clarity to your business. Yes. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. I love this fear fearlessness. And I love the wisdom from your coach. Like this is stuff that you probably couldn't have learned the hard way or would have taken you years to learn is he's saying, step in, go deep, st state your expectations, use your framework, and then back out in three to four months you probably wouldn't have known that without your been there, done that coach. No, I wouldn't have been able to. I mean, yep. I've, I've read uh, well over, well over 1500 books. I yes. threw out 700 last year. Yeah. I just, you know, they just, they're books. You just go right through them, but I could not have read. There's plenty of books on, on building frameworks. I actually needed someone who had been there, done that mm -hmm. in, in addition to the book knowledge. So the book knowledge I found was, very helpful and useful. And we can always refer back to it to reference and such. Um, cause it's not easy. This, these, um, putting these, there's, there's nothing easy about it, but the coaching part of it is, is really, is really critical. And, and, um, and I've had different coaches in different areas, but they've been in different areas, mm -hmm. you know, not the holistic business. Yes. And, and, and that to me, was, um, at this point in time was what we really, really needed. Yes. Yeah. And so, um, one last question here and I'll get, I'll get you back to working on that massive, what did you call it? I got to look at my notes. I love it. MTP. The MTP. Yes. Massive transformational purpose. Oh, I'm like so excited <laughs> for you to hit that. I can't wait for our celebration party. Um, <laughs> but what I want to know, what I want to focus in for a second, because I know I can hear the leaders in the back of my head. Well, that's great for you, Bill. You're in IT and you say you can measure everything. And your example was so specific and perfect for MFA and how that builds up to cybersecurity strategy. What is your answer to that leader who would come to you and be like, Bill, that's great for you, but I can't measure everything in my business. What would you say to that leader who's in my opinion, that's dead easy. wrong. <laughs> no, no, but that's easy. Um, it's, it's not easy, but it does. This is where the leadership requires the, I call it the 80, 20 principle. And okay. there's a couple great books on it. Um, yep. I'm a Pareto principle, Occam's razor, whatever you want to call it. But yep. essentially there's 20%, 20 percent of your business that generates 80% of the value in any area. There's 20% of the people in your business that generate 80, that's the humbling thing. 20% yes. of your people are generating 80% of your results. 20% of the sales reps generate 80% of the revenue. Yes. And that's a law. That's a law that applies across nature and not, and, and, and it's not just, you know, someone just made it up. So I just simply look at the, the individual departments. When you look at the ceiling of complexity, what's the 20% <clears throat> that is most meaningful in this particular area that delivers 80% of the value? And we just, um, so I would just focus, so for security perspective purposes, there's 20% of all the tools, 20% of the processes, 20% of the procedures, 20% of that, are, that cause, that can generate 80% of your value from a threat detection and response perspective. Yeah. And they're not always what people think. And, and so, you know, like patching, of course, and MFA, but when you do MFA, it's got to be configured correctly. So it's not just, yes, I checked the box. So I have MFA. Okay, I have a sales rep. No, no, no. It's what is the 20% of what they're doing yes. that you need to see at a leadership team that will give you 80% of the value. And it, so we just, it, I just use that as the, as the framework. And it takes, I usually, I can't see that in the middle of the day. So it's usually early in the morning or, you know, it's in the leadership team meeting, usually with the coach there that we've had some of our bigger breakthroughs because we have those really hard conversations that, you know, it's, 
very difficult conversations with people. Um, but we have a framework now to have hard, difficult conversations awesome. that make, that are very uncomfortable. And so then we can sit and try to solve these problems and not just talk about them and pontificate about the problem, but what's, what is actually the issue that's going to break that through? And it's usually that 80, 20 rule that we lean into. And I lean into personally. Yes. Oh my gosh. Unbelievably powerful. Oh, and I, I, I mean, the, the notion of staying focused on value, I think, is such a great focus for every single employee because it's very easy for our human brains to get caught up in the doing. Well, I'm doing yes. stuff. I'm checking stuff off the list. And if it's 80%, the who and the do. Yes. <laughs> the who and the do. do. I love it. <laughs> it's, like, it's like a Dr. Seuss business book right there. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's we need to constantly be asking ourselves, how am I delivering value, not what am I doing today? Yeah. And, and that I was also crafting positions around people was something that we also learned. And mm. to, to stop doing that yes. and say, what is this set of processes that we need, the 20% of processes that guarantee us 80% of the value? Yes. And then versus, you know, Henrietta has been with us, you know, five years and Jolene's been with us 10 years and we're going to craft a position around them. No, 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 no. That, that, or, or, you know, someone's been here for a long period of time. So we implicitly trust them. And it's not about trust. It's about what are the set of processes and things that they're doing that del- derive value. I, I'm pontificating right now, but I, me a year ago, you know, I wasn't at that point where I could even understand it. But now, yeah. now with this framework, it's, it is, it's, it's really helped quite a bit to look at, um, what's the, what's the role that we need? What's the seat? What's the role that we need done? And we call it a seat. And then, then we plop in, but then we have described what that is. So that can be done within an IT network, um, for sure. And, you know, what's in, in creating this little engine essentially that could, and, and essentially it's folks, but there's 20% of it that delivers all the value, which is really, really hard to grok. Yes. Oh my gosh. I've learned so much from you today, Bill. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you know, full transparency, my business is right in the middle of this as well, because I'm working on building capacity that doesn't completely all rely on me so that I can, uh, stay married and, um, have a family and sleep and be healthy and deliver amazing value to this world. So the company can deliver amazing value to this world because it's really been a lot of Stephanie doing a lot of this work and I have amazing people who are up for the challenge. So I've just, I've learned so much from you and I know other leaders listening in, um, it leaders are going to get so much value from this conversation. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Oh, you're welcome. It's my pleasure. My pl- I love talking about these these topics. Good. Awesome. Well, you're doing great things and I can't can't again, I can't wait for this big party when you all serve <laughs> um, and impact a billion people and make them secure. So thank you. Well, thank you, Stephanie, and uh, have a great rest of your day. You too. Y'all, so many great lessons learned from Bill's hot mess and his struggles. Certainly that is the point. And I'm so grateful to him for sharing his adventures with us and everything we can learn. I kind of want to start from the tail end of his episode and our conversation and kind of work my way up because, oh, just all of these points need reiterated for my leaders out there because I know too many leaders who are doing this and you're feeling the pain of it. And let's stop doing that, right? Like Bill told us about how he was crafting roles around people versus finding people for the roles that his company needed to be successful. I know too many small businesses that do that. And I know your intent is good, my small business leader or my IT leader, but it can be painful because when that role doesn't work out or really that person doesn't work out in the role or the company outgrows them, it just makes it harder for the company, the leader and that person to move on and frankly slows down the company's ability to be successful. And I love the way he talked about, you know, his uh, his role as a leader is to generate new ideas, make them real, but the team's job is to make them repeatable. I teach all of my clients when they're when they're doing coaching, executive coaching, team coaching. I teach all of my clients that a client's interaction with your company 
needs to be consistent. There needs to be a brand experience that the company provides, not that an individual provides. One, it's a succession planning tool. Two, it's a customer retention tool. And three, it allows people to actually go on vacation because their job can be repeated in other roles because people are cross-trained. There's multiple backup systems that enable them to do their job or other folks to do their job because you've gotten it away from that one person and it's repeatable across systems and it's repeatable within a brand experience in a bigger context than, than just those individuals. Let's talk about massive transformational purpose. Does your company have one? Does your team have one? This conversation with Bill inspired me to create one for my company, and it's not exactly ready for you, but I can't wait to share it with you. But my gosh, when he talked about his massive transformational purpose, I'm not a security expert, but I got goosebumps for them. It's like, oh my gosh, I wanna be a part of that. Do you have that big, value-based, compelling reason why people want to work for you or with you or with this team or with this company, that's the stuff that keeps people going every day. It's, it's not the paycheck. It's not the revenue goal. It's not the profit goal. It's not the team size. It's doing something really, really meaningful day in and day out with people that they know, like, and trust and will be in it with them. That's what people keep, that's what people need when the going get tough. They're not doing it for the paycheck when the going gets tough. Do you know what they're saying when the going gets tough? And they're like, I can take this paycheck and shove it because this is not what I want. But that massive transformational purpose that gives them goosebumps, that gives you goosebumps, and is the why behind your work, it keeps people going, it keeps teams going, it keeps organizations going, especially when the work gets really, really hard. So find your massive transformational purpose. You know, one of my top takeaways from my conversation with Bill is knowing when you hit a ceiling of complexity. Our work should be able to be clarified to a point where it is simple in the people involved, the process involved, and the technology involved. And so when the work gets so complex you don't know what's happening and you're the leader, I would bet my bottom dollar that your team doesn't know what's happening. If you don't have clarity, they don't have clarity. And if they don't have clarity, you don't have clarity. Everyone must have clarity. And so that ceiling of complexity feels frustrating for multiple people involved. And even if you feel like you're clear because you're the leader and your team is coming to you saying, we're not clear, your job as the leader is to create clarity at every level, just like it's their job to create clarity at every single level. Get together, have disciplined meetings so that your people, your process, and your technology are simple because that clarity creates action. When people are confused, they don't take action. So create clarity. So many wonderful leadership lessons. My friends, wherever you're listening in, watching in, make sure you save this episode and repeat this once a week, once a month until you have gotten Bill's lessons ingrained into your leadership style because he has learned some things in a very painful way. You know, he talked about his physical illness. Don't let that be you, my friend. But... The stuff that he's doing is tried and true leadership that's going to help you be a better leader, your team be better leaders, individual employees be better leaders so you can achieve that massive transformational purpose. All right, my friend, let's get back to the things that bring us joy, bring us purpose, maybe communicating that massive transformational purpose if you have one already, or creating some time to come up with one and share that with your team. All right, I'll see you soon, my friend.